20 years ago, children of the world weren't getting the vaccines they needed. The children of most risk in poor countries were the ones who were getting the least vaccines. And so we needed to find the resources to get countries to adopt the vaccines so that every child would be protected against diarrhea, pneumonia, and other killing diseases. Gavi is the, the first global initiative of bringing all the different players to work together to get immunization for the children of the world. At the dramatic increase that happened over the years that followed illustrates how important the initiative was and still is. And we still need the sufficient funding for Gavi for the future of today and tomorrow. Gavi was one of the first um, major platform initiatives of the World Economic Forum and in many ways it serves us as a role model for how the public and private sector should cooperate. Gavi does this better than anybody, is bringing all of those groups around a common table and having a shared vision to move forward. I think that's the secret sauce of Gavi. I think Gavi has done exceptionally well. Since inception in 2000, it has immunized over 760 million children and saved 13 million lives. This is for me a very special moment. The World Economic Forum is celebrating 50 years of existence, and Gavi, which the panel will discuss, is celebrating its 20th birthday. I look at Gavi like a child, and in some way, um, we, we were actually the midwife, if I may say so. Uh, for, for Gavi, and I remember how um, 20 years ago uh, we were sitting together, Bill Gates, the Director General of the World Health Organization, and we just reflected on the fact that despite the promising progress which has been made in immunization efforts, um, at that time there were still I think 30 million people, 30 million children, um, which were living in poor countries and who were not fully immunized. So, with the gracious gift of um, uh, grand, a pledge of um, um, Bill Gates um, of 750 million, Gavi was created. And Gavi, in some way, is probably the best example of public-private partnership. What has been achieved in the last 20 years, I think, uh, exceeds all the dreams which you may have had at that time. And what I particularly appreciate uh, in Gavi is not only like the World Economic Reform that it is a public-private partnership, that, but the way you are providing um, the assistance um, is not characterized by just doing good, but by being efficient and really applying the best of managerial approach uh, to, to make sure uh, that as many children as possible can be integrated into uh, the uh, vaccine uh, efforts. So, you, I'm not mentioning all, all what we have achieved. I think this will do, the panel will do, but please join me in congratulating Gavi for its 20th anniversary. Thank you, Professor Schwab. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session on Gavi as it turns 20. As we just heard and you saw in the video, uh, the Global Alliance for Vaccine and Immunization is a public-private partnership, 
and it has, uh, was created 20 years ago and has done a tremendous job of having vaccinated 760 million people and saved 13 million lives. Um, it has done this through, um, welcome. Um, it has done this through being very single-mindedly focused on its mission to save children's lives and to protect everyone's health by increasing immunization, especially in poor countries. So what has been the key to success for Gavi and what is the future, the future vision as Gavi enters its next phase? This is the, these are the questions we'll try to answer on this panel and I'm very uh, pleased to introduce the panel to discuss this very important questions. Um, to my left is His Excellency Felix Shishakadi, the President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, we have um, Seth Berkeley, Chief Executive Officer of Gavi. We have Christopher Elias, President in the Global Development Program at the uh, Gates Foundation. Paul. Hudson from Chief Executive Officer of Sanofi, and then Ngozi um, Okwanja Ivalu from Gavi. So maybe I will start um, asking a question with the President here. You have recently faced some uh, challenges and dealt with some emergencies in your own country as it relates to outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases like measles and Ebola. How have you handled those and what role has vaccines been able to play there for you? Bien, euh, merci madame. Merci surtout de m'offrir de l'occasion euh, de pouvoir parler de la maladie euh, à virus Ebola euh, qui a ravagé euh, beaucoup de nos concitoyens et qui a eu pour particularité de rester beaucoup plus longtemps que, que les épidémies précédentes. Ici, elle a duré plus d'un an et elle a fait beaucoup plus de victimes. Il y avait 3400 cas à peu près, euh, euh, sur lesquels il y a eu 2200 et quelques victimes. Euh, ceci a été euh, très difficile euh, dans un premier temps, vu l'évolution de la maladie. Mais euh, grâce à la vaccination et à la prise en charge plus rapide euh, euh, amenée par euh, un expert euh, congolais à la renommée internationale, le docteur Jean-Jacques Mouyembe, que j'ai immédiatement placé euh, quelques mois après euh, mon arrivée à la tête de, du pays euh, aux commandes d'une cellule we organized a cell, an emergency, emergency cell in my country, and from 21 cases that were active at that time, today we only have between zero and three cases per day. So I think I can say that the illness, little by little, is disappearing, thanks to vaccination and thanks to uh, rapid treatment for um, the uh, ill people. Chris, maybe I can start with you first. Um, as we saw, the Gates Foundation has been a founder of Gavi, and 20 years ago um, uh, this was launched. You have been involved in it yourself directly. What is the model that has made Gavi as successful as it is? Thank you, Sarita. And let me join others in wishing uh, Professor Schwab congratulations on the 50th anniversary <laughs> of the World Economic Forum, as well as celebrating Gavi's 20th anniversary. The other organization that turns 20 this year is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Mm. And the story within the Gates Foundation about Gavi is that it was one of our first, one of our largest, and one of our best investments. And it reflects, you know, it's hard almost to imagine where we were 20 years ago with under five child mortality, almost double what it was, is today. And as Professor Schwab said, the Gavi model has been one of the best um, examples of an alliance, of, of committed individuals, institutions, partners coming together for common purpose to reduce under five child mortality, largely through the prevention of vaccine preventable diseases. 
And while Bill and Melinda made a, a phenomenal, generous gift in t uh, 20 years ago, um, it was really just to spark the alliance and to bring in many other partners, governments, UN agencies, WHO, UNICEF, the World Bank were there at the launch 20 years ago, to say we all need to come together to solve one of the world's biggest problems. And we've seen that happen. We've seen the Gavi model expand the number of um, vaccines available to children almost threefold um, in the last 20 years. We've seen it work with the industry to bring down the per vaccine prices dramatically in some cases. And in some ways, not by changing the profit motive of the industry, but providing clear signals about the demand, about the supply, what was needed from the industry so that they could shape their efforts in the development of vaccines and the production of vaccines to meet a market, a market that Gavi aggregates for the poorest countries of the world, and through that helps to make vaccines more affordable and available to children around the world. So we've seen tremendous expansion in the number of children reached with vaccine, 13 million lives saved as a consequence in the last 20 years, the last generation. We've also seen important models in terms of financial sustainability. Um, the fact that Gavi requires even the poorest countries of the world to co-finance according to their means and to ultimately graduate as they achieve the economic growth that preventing vaccine preventable diseases helps to fuel, um, you see a, a model of sustainability with significant proportions of the actual immunization costs now being borne by countries themselves. And I think in the spirit of, of the theme of today's uh, conference, one of the great things that, um, that Gavi's accomplished is to reduce the inequity. 20 years ago, vaccines would come out of a robust uh, pipeline of science and technology and quickly be taken up by the world's richest countries. And the lag between those innovations being available to children in rich countries and children in poor countries was about 15 to 18 years and growing. Um, and in a, in, a, in a society where we see growing inequities in many dimensions, Gavi has fought that tide and has reduced the inequities. The rotavirus vaccine was launched in poor countries the same year it was launched in rich countries. So I think it's, a, it's an incredible model. It's got some incredible challenges left uh, for the next 20 years, but I think we have a lot to celebrate today. Well, thank you for that. Um, Seth, moving to you, of course, you have been driving the engine behind the success, but as you look forward to the future, what else needs to happen and what is the, the vision for Gavi? So thank you, and let, let me add my thanks to the forum. Um, I've been coming for a long time, and, and it's amazing how we bring together decision makers and have them focus on these important problems. But it isn't only vaccine people, it's obviously people working across all of the different areas that can help drive forward this agenda. As Chris has just said, the model is really interesting and has been successful. We've launched 433 new vaccines. We've been able to lift up coverage over 20 percentage points for the basic vaccines. But where are we today? Well, vaccines are the most widely distributed health intervention. Today, 90% of children worldwide get at least one dose of vaccine as part of a routine vaccine system. That last 10%, though, those are the ones. Two-thirds of those zero-dose children are below the poverty line. If they're not getting vaccines, they're not getting any health intervention. So if they get sick, they're less likely to recover. If they have an epidemic that starts in those communities, there's not the system to pick it up. So what we'd like to do is not just pivot, but, but continue the work to really work with countries to try to focus in on those that are left behind. And once we bring a vaccine to them, of course, you know, the secret is vaccines don't get deliver themselves. So what we're bringing is a health worker, a supply chain, a data system, a cold chain. And with that, we really create the, the kind of setup for universal health coverage and primary health care. Of course, without prevention, we can't afford those types of health issues. Last thing I'd say on that is that not every country will be able to completely reform their health systems by 2030, the year the SDGs are done. But 
we could immunize every child, and that would make a dramatic difference. So this is one of our main goals. Of course, we still want to continue to work on epidemics. We still want to make sure that new vaccines that come out will be there, but, but that's the primary pivot that we're going to try to do. Great. Um, and uh, it's interesting because you talked about, you know, creating markets, financing, vaccines, innovation. So, Paul, um, I guess you're representing uh, the innovation part in the upfront to actually having vaccines. And um, what would you say from your standpoint and the overall industry standpoint, um, do you feel ready to be able to support that? I think that the success of Gavi is actually quite impressive because we, I believe Gavi went from having vaccines for six diseases to 18 diseases. Um, so what else is industry able to do for the future of vision? Well, thank you. And let me add my uh, congratulations to Gavi at 20. Let me also add actually uh, congratulations for the Alaska uh, Bloomberg uh, Public Service Award. Uh, I know how prestigious that is, and it says a lot about the work that's being done. You mentioned it in your opening, actually, that I think over 760 million mm -hmm. uh, patients uh, are vaccinated or immunized, and uh, 13 million uh, uh, you know, ch right. child deaths avoided, uh, and the tragedy that would unfold with those you know, I've been in the industry uh, close to 30 years. Um, I've only recently taken over as uh, the CEO of Sanofi. And um, I feel like uh, uh, vaccines is a very special place. We have an incredible team at Sanofi, David Lowe, uh, who leads our team. Uh, the work they do is exceptional. Now, I've been in the industry a long time. You ask a little bit about preparedness and readiness. And if we get time for a second question, we'll talk ecosystem. But up front, as I've toured our manufacturing sites and met our people, I'm staggered by the call to action, the purpose-driven nature of the workers in this area. This is really, for me at least, having been around a long time, this is something above and beyond. Whilst there's a huge amount of pride in what we do in the industry around medicines, there is, seems to be an extra calling. And it can be everything from polio right through to influenza. There is a speed, there's a discipline, and there's an excellence because people know what's at stake. And I think it's quite incredible, the work. Um, it's the first time that I've worked with an organization such as Gavi. And it's bold. It must have been bold at the time, what it can bring together, because it is one of those challenges that can't physically be solved uh, on, uh, by an individual contributor. It needs the collaboration, and it needs the call to action. And um, you know, for us, we put uh, forward um, you know, tremendous opportunities for patients with yellow fever, with cholera, um, um, uh, uh, with our uh, pentavalent um, uh, wholesale. You know, we've really tried to bring something to that party and work with UNICEF, Gavi. You know, it shows me actually and inspires me for other areas across the diseases. What is actually possible if you do it right? Now, I feel a bit of a fraud because I'm new and I'm uh, enjoying the incredible work that's been done, there is tons to do, for sure. You know, we are the, the world's biggest producer of injectable polio vaccine. We have made over 16 billion doses in the last 30 years of oral uh, polio. You know, and the job just simply isn't done yet, isn't yet, right? It just simply isn't done yet. And in fact, in some ways we have to say there is still work to do in polio itself. So. Um, there is something important about the ecosystem, and if we get time, I'd like to talk about how maybe we can maybe bring we'll, that together. We come back to that. Um, so, Inguzi, um, you're, of course, the chairwoman of Gavi, and uh, there's a lot there that you are playing a role. But I think you bring a very interesting perspective from a development standpoint and also having been finance minister, because as we heard, the financing aspects were very well. Um, from your standpoint, what do you see that countries need to do in terms of making themselves actually prepared, you know, um, for being self-sustainable at some point of the, of the process? Well, thank you very much, uh, Rita. Let me also join others in saying that this is a, a happy moment in which uh, both uh, the Forum and Gavi are celebrating. I think we really need to think about it because this is a success story. And in a world where there's so much uncertainty and people are you know, so dismal about many things, here's one story of something working at scale that we can talk about. And your question about how to institutionalize 
is really important. One of the reasons I was excited to join Gavi as chair of the board is because it's an organization that wants to work itself out of a job. So Gavi try, gets from, from the start, as both uh, Chris and Seth said, tries to make sure countries are involved in managing and financing their own program. For instance, in this next period we're going in 2021 to 2025, countries are going to pay 41% of the total cost of vaccines, $3.6 billion. And we try to work with them in a progressive fashion so they increasingly take charge and until they, they graduate. So that's one of the things. How do, and the way we work the, with them makes it possible. So it's not like, like a sudden thing that you wake up overnight and say, okay, now you're in charge of your own program. So that's one, progressive taking over of the financing and of course supporting them to mobilize more domestic resources so that they can pay for the vaccines. The other aspect of the finance is the countries being helped to negotiate with pharmaceuticals, you know, we have a mechanism so that the vaccines can be affordable. So that's on the finance side, one of the factors. The second factor is capacity. Uh, even if you have the finance, if you don't have the capacity on the ground to deliver, that's, you know, you need to have yeah. a, a whole value chain with the coal chain, with the workers, you know, so working with community-based organizations to deliver, working with the government itself to deliver civil society, uh, this is one of the aspects that is critically important as countries uh, take over that capacity uh, on the ground. And the third aspect, I think, is data. You know, for a government to know that it is succeeding in reaching, you know, the right levels of immunization for its children, uh, whether if you're 81%, as we have on average now, we'd like to move to 95 so that the child we haven't reached is covered, you have to have data and you have to monitor. So building that capacity to get good data is also very important. Great, thank you. Um, Your Excellency, if I will come back to you. Um, so you've heard the panel talk about what Gavi has done and how they have done uh, it and also what countries can do. So as you think about what you want to achieve in your country, what would be your ask of Gavi um, and others on this panel? And how can they help you? What would, where are the areas of need? Where are the gaps? And uh, what might you recommend as areas that we could develop in? Thank you. I think that the shortcomings are to be found in the uh, level of vaccination particularly compared with the routine vaccination or response vaccination when there is an epidemic which has been triggered. Mrs. Konjua spoke about something which I think is very relevant here. And I think that uh, this is something that we really have to face up to, and that is the, uh, the price of vaccines. I think the price is relatively high, and in my view, on the strength of international cooperation, thanks also to interventions uh, such as the one provided by Gavi, I think what we need to do is to have prices brought down so that countries are in a position position to be able to procure the vaccines necessary. I think it is through international cooperation and cooperation between different uh, states uh, that this will be achievable. Just to take the country uh, that I represent, I was uh, uh, asked uh, to be the champion in Central Africa of the uh, vaccination, and I accepted to spearhead uh, this project. And uh, we're going to have a follow-up meeting in uh, February. In fact, it's on the 18th of February. I will be there, and I'm really going to get uh, firmly involved. For that, I've uh, invited uh, provincial governments uh, and governments from the area to mobilize. And I think that we need to go from a vaccination rate, uh, which in Congo is about 35 percent, and I'd like uh, to double that uh, figure, and I'd like uh, to see the figure rise to 70 percent. We need to develop what we're uh, trying out in Congo. That is to say, we wanted to implement uh, an opening uh, of a universal health uh, 
system. That is a crucial step. Why? Because it will mean that we will be able to reach out and to administer primary health care uh, services and provide those services particularly to children. And I hope uh, that this will give us a much better response rate and we will be able to have vaccinations, or vaccines rather, which will be administered uh, to all those who come along with uh, various illnesses. Yeah, thank you for that. And maybe some of the panelists, as we speak now, can address some of the points that uh, the President has raised um, as well. But uh, maybe uh, if I could ask you, Chris, um, what do you think in today's world of the uh, fourth industrial revolution, how can technology actually help us to get to the next levels of um, uh, challenges that we have, and both you and Seth mentioned some of them. Uh, thank you, Sarita. I, I think that, um, you know, Gavi's journey, like any race, uh, to do anything important, the last mile's uh, harder than the first mile. And, um, you know, we've, as Seth said, we've reached at least 90 percent of children with some vaccines. We've reached about 80 percent of children with a full course. We still have dropouts, kids who get their first dose and don't get doses two and three. And I think we need to take what has made Gavi a success in the last 20 years, that is innovation, and continue to apply it. Because those last 10 to 20 percent of children are not like the first 80 to 90 percent. They may be in a slum. They may be in a highly mobile family fleeing conf conflict. They may be in a very remote area. Um, they may be in places where seasonal interruptions of the road network prevent the vaccines from getting. This is where technologies from the fourth industrial revolution can help. When Gavi started 20 years ago, we naturally worked with the vaccine industry. But if you look at Gavi's partnership list today, it includes, I met yesterday with uh, the chairman of the NEC company in, in Japan. They have a fingerprint ID technology that is being used in a partnership with Gavi to help track children so that we can find children who may be moving from one place to another from their first dose to their final dose of a vaccine. We work with a, a range of supply chain and logistics companies, UPS, others, who are helping to bring their cutting edge expertise and tech tracking technologies to understand what's the best route to get around the flood that took out the bridge. How do we get the vaccines to the places. There are drone companies now involved in helping uh, leapfrog geographic barriers to get vaccines into uh, critical places. A whole range of refrigeration and cold chain companies that are, are developing solar powered, off grid, um, long hold uh, time uh, refrigeration so that vaccines, which are perishable, right? They're, they often need to be kept between three and seven degrees centigrade from the factory to the child. Um, and if those last children are in very difficult to place, work, uh, uh, reach places, we're going to need all of that technological. So it's not just increasingly working with the vaccine industry to capture the cutting edge of science and technology for heat uh, sensitivity, et cetera, but also working with a vast array of corporations who can bring their expertise to solving this last mile challenge, reaching those zero dose children, and making sure that every child that is reached gets the full dose and the full benefit of the Gavi model. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Seth, I would like you to maybe address uh, the point that the President raised, especially related to pricing. And uh, in addition, I would like to ask about uh, this conversation around universal health coverage and uh, how you think about that and the linkage of that of what you're trying to do in Gavi. Well, first of all, I'd like to compliment the president because um, Chris and I visited him last year and he brought all of the provincial governors and said, you're responsible in a decentralized systems. You have to make sure that we move forward. And the fact that he's just said publicly again, I'm going to hold them accountable is really important. Of course, he needs technology. He has a very difficult geographic area. And the issue he talks about in pricing is important. The, the, if you look at the 11 vaccines that WHO recommends, they cost around $1,300. It's not exactly the same, say, in the U.S., but similar vaccines. Right now, they're about $27 in Gavi. And that's because we buy vaccines for 60% of the world's children, 
and because we've been able to work with the pharmaceutical sector to help us. We have to make sure they're still profitable. And so the challenge has been to expand the number of manufacturers. We've gone from a small number, five when we started, to now 17 different manufacturers, creating healthy competition. And so that process needs to continue to go on. What I'm excited about is as new diseases appear, the vaccine industry is on it and, and brings us new vaccines, and that's one of the important issues. We're this year moving into our replenishment. We have to raise at least $7.4 billion, and that's to bring these new vaccines forward, but to do this type of work, and that's important. But to just quickly answer your question, our belief is if you build that system out, that primary health care system, which is responsible for 85% of health. Mm -hmm. there, there's some stuff that you need the tertiary centers for, but most of it can be done in the primary health care system. If we can bring that out to every person in the DRC, that is where we'll get the dramatic benefit. And in a way, as Ngozi said, by doing it with vaccines, we can actually measure whether that system is really delivering a just and change using the technology Chris talked about to make sure that we're able to do it. And that's how we can get towards success. Excellent. Um, coming back to you, Paul, I know you had a few things in mind that you wanted to discuss. Um, but specifically, maybe you can also um, talk about where is the industry going from the future standpoint? What innovation and investment is the industry looking to make? Thank you. Um, so I think uh, what is quite clear, as an industry, we continue to push what we can in terms of breaking ground on new science. We're challenged by Gavi, we're challenged by patients, and rightly so. Um, for us at Sanofi, of course, we have a few things uh, directly in front of us. We have a, uh, an improved process to help us with yellow fever, which we think will bring benefits across the board. Um, we have a hexavalent six in one, of which uh, one is an injectable uh, polio vaccine, which we know how critical uh, that's going to be. Of course, we also have uh, uh, a uh, preventative for respiratory syntestitial virus, which again is a worldwide epidemic of sorts. And, uh, and we're proud to be behind those things. I think the panel and others are right to say, what are you doing next and where does it go? His Excellency also raises the question on pricing, which I think is a very valid question. You know, coming new in, like I said, to vaccines, I'm struck by this very delicate balance, and it is a delicate balance in the ecosystem. How do we make sure that we are there when you need us with uh, the volumes and the inventory that is ready to go? I think not everybody fully expects or understands that it can take up to six years to validate a new manufacturing uh, facility and then uh, and start to build inventory. And in this case, uh, you really, uh, six years is not responsive enough if you have an outbreak or a resurgence or a mutation or some form. Um, and that's a huge, big investment. Uh, there's a push, of course, for lower and lower prices and in some cases a push towards a dollar even to see where we get to. And it's fine lines between building capacity for the long term and getting the appropriate price. Now what I think is special about the Gabby relationship is I think that that balance can be reached. Um, but it does require long term planning and long term thinking to maintain the ecosystem. Because if you're not planning ahead and if you're not building ahead, you lose that ability to move and help support. And that requires long-term tendering, for example, and long-term thinking. We may see that as a big open question um, as we get to, to polio coming up. So I think we're co completely committed. I think um, Seth mentioned the, uh, the number of manufacturers. We know because of the way uh, tendering and price and volumes have gone. There's only really one manufacturer for measles and rubella now remaining, one. And that has some inherent risk in it. And that also means that's not a situation competitively or, frankly, for the patients that we serve that is acceptable over the long term. So we have to get that ecosystem right so there are multiple players, long -term, long, very long-term thinking and a commitment to pull through the R&D um, from the industry. And it's not easy, right? Um, I'm new to it, but I'm excited about how we can, we can balance those things together. 
Yeah, I think the industry uh, is critical, obviously, and there are new outbreaks coming out, so certainly you have your challenge there ahead of you as an industry to be able to provide that innovation that is so needed. Um, Nguzi, um, maybe we can just um, take the learnings from Gavi and from your insights, and you know, how might we be able to take this and apply it to the broader development context? There's a lot of conversation here at Davos as well as all year round that we are talking about. We have the SDG goals, we have the 2030 milestone. Um, are there learnings here that we can take and apply to other sectors and how might we go about it? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, yes. I, I, I think that um, you know, the Gavi model was a bit ahead of its time. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it was something that you know, was set up at that time and now it's become kind of the type of model that the whole world is seeking to go, we should be seeking to emulate. This multi-stakeholder approach to problems. We've recognized that none of the sustainable development goals can be attained without a multi-stakeholder approach. Working in silos or one sector without partnerships can do it. So Gavi embodies this partnership with the private sector, with civil society, with governments, uh, both developing and developed countries, everybody is, is, is in there. And I think this is a big lesson for development. But what is good about Gavi is that we've shown that it can work. Just to give you an example of this multi-stakeholder approach, His Excellency, uh, Mr. President, spoke about the fact that they had the Ebola crisis and they were able to deal with it much faster. That was because we had been able to stockpile this working with the with, with the private sector, with the pharmaceuticals. And so when that happened, there was a stockpile ready to go. If we were not doing this partnership approach, this multi-stakeholder type of thinking, we wouldn't be able to do it. I think the second part is scale. Gavi has shown that it can scale. And one of the big problems we have in development is the lack of scale. We have lots of good pilot projects and examples everywhere. But how many times can we talk of reaching a billion people? That's what Gavi is doing in the next five years. We will reach a billion children and we will save, you know, more than 20 million lives. So those two things are very applicable. The last point I want to make is on the financing. Gavi has a financial instrument called the International Finance Facility for Immunization, where we actually, with government guarantees, go to the market and we raise money on the markets to help finance. This is also applicable. Everybody is looking for innovative approaches to financing. And now education. We are going to do the International Finance Facility for Education okay. based on this. So I think on those three grounds, we've really got a model ahead of its time that we can use. Yeah, I, I was also thinking of education when I was thinking if we took a model like this and applied it to education, that would be a good foundation for the broader development. Um, so we have a few minutes left, and uh, maybe um, since it is the celebration of the 20 years, Seth, I would come back to you to talk about, um, you know, we've talked about what Gavi has done, huge accomplishments, and what you hope to do. Um, what would be your ask of the stakeholders that are here in Davos um, to help you get to that mission, and what might be some specific areas that you'd want to sort of leave behind as thoughts that we could all take back. So, so one thing I want to say just before I answer that is, um, you know, we're celebrating us and the forum. It was here in 2015 that the Advanced Purchase Commitment, another innovative financing mechanism, was set up to make sure there'd be an Ebola vaccine just in case there was an outbreak. And so when there was an outbreak and multiple in DRC, we were able to bring that vaccine forward. So, I mean, the important thing is people think about Gavi as a as a vertical initiative. We're about vaccines, that's it. But of course, that's not true. We're about health systems and supply chains and you know, refrigeration and data systems and identity. And so th the real question is how does the rest of the world help us get to these goals? These are noble goals. We have to work with industry. It's not about charity. How do we open new markets for industry? How do we get to the bottom of the pyramid and be able to bring them in? And I think to me, this is what I'm excited about because the more we can bring in the best technology from different sectors, the more we can move forward. In Rwanda today, 
all blood is being delivered by drone. If a woman goes and is hemorrhaging in a clinic in rainy season, how many units of blood? They're there for her. There's no wastage. And they're doing it for the price of a motorcycle delivery. We're beginning to experiment with drones in the DRC, in Ghana, and other countries. These are examples of how technology, like the cell phone, has leapfrogged. And what I need is help from all of the corporate partners, as well as the political leaders, to move us forward in a movement. Great. Um, it, it is um, interesting to hear the panel here, because this is truly an example of a very good example of uh, the multi-stakeholder approach and the public-private partnership. And it's not just the business from the health sector, but it's really businesses across the sector, as you said, from supply chain industries, those who can uh, reach the last mile. And there are many, many industries and sectors who are actually providing all sorts of products in the last mile, so there's opportunity there for them to engage. Um, I think the data piece that you talk about becomes very, very critical um, to drive actually data that then helps us make the right decisions and know where the interventions need to come in. Um, so it's, um, I want to thank the panel because uh, the president has you know, laid out very good uh, explanations of where you have solved some of the situations that you have uh, faced. Um, you have others, you've got some great targets to double the uh, penetration of the vaccination and we have here for you the people who can make that happen. Um, I think on the industry side, certainly the industry has been critical and delivered on the vaccination. Uh, unfortunately, we do see new outbreaks coming out. Even uh, this week we've had some news items, so we do see challenges ahead of us. And, and I think together we can um, really make all this happen. So I do want to congratulate Gavi on its 20th anniversary, certainly for the World Economic Forum. It is a very special moment having launched it on our platform 20 years ago. As you said, Ngozi, it was maybe ahead of its time, but it is really showing us the way for what we can do, not only in the vaccination arena, but also in other development goals. So thank you for your time, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>